We went in to Iraq um, to look for Scud missiles, but we broke every standing operating procedure going. Now, the SAS have what they call SOPs, and it's, uh, it's, how, we pr like, um, it's how we conduct operations. Well, we, our maps dated back to 1945. We didn't have the right clothing. We didn't have the right radios. Um, we didn't have the right intel. And um, we were going in to basically dig in underground um, to an area that overlooked a, a main supply route. And um, when we got there, we found that the main supply route wasn't like a tarmac road. It was just a series of tracks. Well, the, the missile, the Scud, can't drive down them tracks. It needs to be on like a proper road. So we knew we were in the wrong place. And the weather, the weather was a big factor. It was the worst winter Iraq was having for 30 years. And uh, it was within a short period of time we were compromised. And um, we tried to um, establish communications back to base. Couldn't get through. I eventually got through by tapping out Morse code to some guy in Cyprus who then relayed a message back. But by that time, it was too late. We ended up in a contact and then Iraqis tracking us down. Over the period of, say, two or three days, um, well, the first day, I was split up from the group with two of the lads. Um, sadly, um, in, in, in the early hours of the next, well, next day it started snowing. And uh, Vince died of hypothermia right next to us, and we had the same clothes. So I watched I watched a man die, uh, freezing to death. Then the other lad he went off with a goat herder, and then I was ended up by myself. And um, basically, yeah, seven days, eight nights, uh, to hit the Syrian border, um, and the cold was the the hardest thing during the day. I couldn't move. Um, I would try and find a hollow, somewhere to hide. Desert floor, there's nothing there. And this just this wind cutting through, um, had cold injuries and all the rest. And then the first night on the run, we did 70 kilometers, about 50 miles, and we were carrying our bell kits, which was about 50 pounds. I burned my feet because we were really hammering it. So the blisters then got infected. Um, I was losing weight rapidly every day. You're lying there just friggin' freezing and no sleep. Um, and then at night, I could start moving. And, um, you know, you keep bumping into Iraqis and, and various others. Then eventually got to the border. And um, when I got across the border, I got to a Syrian, like, well, like Bedouin. Uh, they got me into a town, but then there was a lynch mob trying to, like, get me back into Iraq. Uh, then the police held a mock execution for me um, where they <clears throat> blindfolded me, put a pistol to my head, and I eventually got back to Damascus um, where I was handed over to the secret police. And during a, that, that first handover, I was allowed to use like a bathroom to clean myself up because obviously I hadn't washed or anything and shave. Um, but I'd lost 36 pound in body weight in seven days, or lost all my toenails. Uh, all the blisters had turned uh, septic. There was pus coming out of them. I had what you no know, was bed sores on the sides of my leg, my back, arms, elbow. And then if I squeezed my fingernails, there was pus coming out of them. Um, if I sucked in my mouth blood, I had a blood disorder, damaged liver, damaged kidneys. Um, I drank some water that had come from a, a chemical plant and that was full of effluent that had burnt my mouth. Um, and then it took three days to get out of, out of Damascus, got into Riyadh and then a flight back to the base in Saudi where my squadron was. And then it transpired, four of the guys had been captured, two had died of, of uh, hypothermia, froze to death, legs had tried to swim the Euphrates and uh, he died immediately on the other side. Um, and one guy was shot and killed. So um, two guys died of, of, of cold, which is criminal uh, because we didn't have the right kit, right, um, right radios. And, um, and also we've been told that if we were contacted, they would send in a helicopter to pick us up. But when we did get contacted, uh, they changed their mind. 
and um, and said, no, let them let them write them off. Suicide mission. Yeah, that was it. Like you're gone. I mean, it's it's no big deal because that's what you've got the SAS for. And what the other thing, to be fair, when they sent that, if they sent a helicopter in to get us, they would have probably had to send two or three, and we only had uh, two to the regiment. And if the risks were, if we'd been caught by the Iraqis, it could have been a come on. So when the helicopters came in, they'd have been blown out the sky or you're risking having maybe 60 guys in that helicopter to come and rescue eight. And if it went down, got hit, you've lost all of them guys. And remember, you know, the SES are trained in escape and evasion. Um, but I mean, yeah, that was it. So yeah, it was 200 miles um, to the Syrian border. Uh, it was the longest seven days of my life. <laughs> Does that not make you angry, though? To, is that just part on part of the job? Just part, and you've got to accept that? it. I mean, I didn't have any food and very little water. In fact, at the end, I was hallucinating because of the, the lack of water. My brain had, sh like, shrunk. Um, but you've just got to accept it. It was just one of them things from the point when we were compromised, everything was going to go downhill. Because, again, I can remember when I was getting on the helicopter to fly in, um, one of the lads was standing there, and he was like, this is not right. I went, I know. I said, it's a one-way ticket, but we're still fucking going. And um, and that was it. You know, you, I guess the regiment, when I say they use the word gamblers, they'll take risks, you know, to pull something off. But you know, if it goes wrong, it's going to go catastrophically wrong, and it'll just, the, the dominoes will fall. Um, because again, you know, you're out there by yourself. And so, seeing you, you're going through that for the seven days. What's going through your mind then? Did you, at any point did you think I'm, I'm a goner? Or did well, you, every did you keep believing to yourself? No, I'm not no. Every, to die? every day, there's one. It sounds it's going to sound really pathetic, but there was the first day I was by myself. Um, I made the Euphrates, and I had to crawl into the Euphrates to get to a depth to fill my water bottle because I didn't have any water. And uh, I left. It was still dark. And I started to push back into the, the what they call the wadi systems, these dried riverbeds. And I found one, and it was on a north-facing slope. So I got into a hollow and lay there. I was fucking freezing, like, because I was wet again, and the temperatures are below, below zero. And I'm like, fuck. And I knew I was by myself now, and I knew I probably had five or six days of walking. And uh, I, I don't know what it was, but this thing popped up in my head, and... Uh, it was me mother talking to us, going, as a kid, she used to say, if things get on top of you, just have a good cry. Just uh, just cry and you'll, you'll get over it. So I'm sat there and I can look around, like uh, make sure nobody's looking. And then I went, <laughs> <coughs> I couldn't cry. But what it did is I started laughing. And I laugh, I was just like laughing. And it, it actually cleared my mind. And I was like, right, yeah. You are by yourself. You've got five days walking. You've got no food. You've got water. Everything's okay at the minute. And it was just boom. And then I could plan. But having said all of that, every night after that, there'd be times where I was walking and I was that knackered. I would get like, you know, I'd end up on my knees feeling sorry for myself. And then you start shivering and then you're like, come on, you to get moving. And there was, there was, it got to the point where my feet were that bad with it when, when they were infected that the pain was too much to... I would sit down and then the, it, the pain would like move from my feet and I'd be like that. <sighs> but when it came to move, which was, which was in probably a couple of minutes because it was freezing cold and I happened to stand on them, I had to shuffle, like just shuffle a couple of steps and it must have looked fucking pathetic really until my feet were numb again and then I could start walking and then it got to the point where I would rest on my rifle and I would keep the pressure on my feet and then carry on moving and then at the seven day point it was more through the lack of water um, I started collapsing but I was hallucinating and um, one day one night my daughter came in front of us and I was trying to grab a hold of her hand in like I could see her feet moving, rocks moving, and I was just following it. I don't know what I passed on the left or right of me. And then what would happen is the first time it happened, it was like a static when, when you hear like electricity going like that. And then I got punched in the back of the head. It was this big bang. 
And it was that realistic. When I went, I went down on my knees, I turned around to see who'd punched me. And obviously there was nobody there. So I got myself up. It happened again. And when I came to, I'd, I was flat out on the desert floor shaking. I'm like, that. that's a stupid place to, to fall asleep. Then it did it again. Um, I was I was across the border. It did happen again, and I'd fallen against a small like wall, broke my nose, and then at first light I could see a house, and that was the Syrians that gave me the water and tea. But I was fucked. Now, a human body, a human usually can go ten days without food, but water you'll get three days maximum, maximum before you go. And what what them bangs were? That was my my brain shorting it out it was my brain was shrinking and the messages that go around your brain were just fucking colliding and it was like you just your body's closing down but it's your brain that's closing your body down and uh, i knew i was knackered and when i came to i could see the small house with smoke coming coming from it and i thought you know what if it's if it's a rack i'm taking water and i'll kill them i don't give a shit now if it's syria then they should help me and I got there, there was a, a young lass um, with like a look upturned walk making a bread on a fire. An old boy was leaving the, the like mud hut with some goats. And then this young lad came out and uh, I just said, water, water. And then I was saying, Iraq, Iraq. And he didn't, I said, Syria, Syria. And he went, ah, Syria, Syria. And then he was like, yaki, yaki. And then I could see the border. So I knew I was in Syria. And then he went straight in, gave us this bowl of water, drank it, and then in in the room, um, he gave us a, a small glass of sweet tea, and it was like being on chemicals. It was just like boom, and that was just a bit of sugar. And it was like woof. And I said, right, I need to get to a police station. Um, I packed my rifle up, my bell kit up. He gave us a bag. I wanted to see what my feet were in, what state they were in. Pulled them off. He he then. He pulled. He requested his sister. I think she then disappeared with my socks, and I mean they were minging. There was puss and everything in them. So like washed the, the clean my sh- like feet off. She brought the socks back, put them on, and then I drew her like a diagram on a, a piece of pa- like newspaper with a, a crayon, and said I need a policeman. So as we were walking into town, there was <clears throat> this Syrian coming out, and he'd been buying. Um, stuff for his camels here and he could speak a bit of English and uh, he said what do you want and I was like I need to get to a police station and to him I was saying I'm a pilot uh, crashed my aircraft and went in through a series of things that happened he got to a garage and uh, pulled into the garage and he'd been saying to me I should take you back to Iraq because my cousins are from Iraq and I'm like no I ain't going back to Iraq I need to see the police Kept touching the uh, bag to see if I had a weapon in there. Well, there was two two guys filling diesel up at a pump like that. They came straight up the window, didn't look at me, looked down at the bag, and then ran off to the back of the, the garage. So I was like, it's kicking off. So I grabbed my bag, and as I was like getting out of the vehicle, he grabbed my arm, so I dragged the fu- fucker over the chairs and like started slamming his head on the door. Then I was running down the street, and I would have said I was I was sprinting, and I turned around, there was about two 70-year-old guys just like this behind me. But them young lads had come out and they had like, you know, their sticks and stuff. And I just just kept on running and came around this corner and there was a guy with an AK-47 and he just had, wait, it was a police station. He grabbed me, otherwise they would have had me and there would have been, I would have been over the thing. He grabbed me, took me into a courtyard and then held the crowd outside. And then over a few, a few hours, um of like sending a couple of code words hoping that they would get to the coalition they give me this dish dash to put on and a shamag over my face and two guys marched me out into a car they didn't tell me where they were taking me or anything and uh, they took me out to the middle of the desert and there was a pre-arranged rv with a secret police and that's when this guy put the put the gun to my head and then the next minute i was in damascus handed over i mean the gun thing they were just pulling the piss they were just having a laugh uh, but i'd lost my sense of humor at that point um, <laughs> you know. so but anyway i got into syria fuck me they couldn't have done enough for me they sent me out they sent a young lad out took my measurements like got me a, a suit shirt socks underpants and shoes but my feet were in ba- that 
bad a state I couldn't get the shoes on and then they got me round to the British Embassy where I was there for two days and I had to wait to get a passport made and then then the Syrians wouldn't let me leave the country because I didn't have the incoming visa so I had to go back to the secret police and they got the visa stamped and then I got back to the regiment 